Welcome back, everybody, to the Westlake Hornets Team Builder Dynasty here on NCAA Football 14. Today, we continue our long-term sim here to finish out the series. Last season, which was season 18, ended up being a very successful one. We went undefeated in the regular season, barely beat Cal in the Pac-12 championship, and then dominated against the Oklahoma Sooners in the national championship game to give us our sixth national championship victory in school history. The senior quarterback, Anthony Cortez III, had a very strong final game as a Hornet, and the defense was really impressive against a very talented Oklahoma offense. Our first five national championship wins were all very close for the most part, but this one was an absolute rout from the start. I do want to take a brief look at the stats just so you guys can get a reminder of what happened last season. I went more in depth over the stats at the end of last episode, but just as a reminder, here is a look at how the team did. Certainly one of our most successful seasons yet, going undefeated in the regular season, then of course winning a national title. So we're going to get right on into the offseason. In today's episode, it'll be formatted similar to the past few in which we'll cover the offseason, the preseason, the regular season, and the postseason. We're going to do all of that within a 30 or so minute span. Coach Mason Conway would get a contract extension from the school, a six-year extension. Very well deserved for Coach Mason Conway, who has led this team to six national championship victories in 18 seasons. Pretty impressive for a new football program who had never played football before the start of this series. We have a new offensive coordinator. His name is Junior Adams. Our previous offensive coordinator, Brett Brennan, left for a new job. He is now the head coach at Michigan. That's a big-time position, so congratulations to Brett Brennan. Very well-deserved. He's going to be coaching one of the premier programs in the nation, even if they haven't you know, won a ton of games as of recent. Going into the players' leaving stage, we have a very big and impactful senior class, and we have a lot of talented draft-eligible players, and we got hit pretty hard. A lot of key guys declaring early. Derek Davis wants to transfer, and then, of course, an absolutely loaded senior class. So we have, what is that, seven players declaring early, including defensive lineman Slavko Savic, who would have had a bigger role this year. He did have a pretty big role last year. He was pretty good at 20 tackles for loss. Antonio Osborne, that's a big loss. He had 89 pancakes in the past two years. That is a lot. So it sucks he's leaving. Joko Unwosu, the three-year starter, he kind of has been quiet. The past couple of years had his statistically worst season this year as a junior, but he's definitely an NFL talent. Randy Powell, talented inside corner. I think he would have had a bigger role this year had he stuck around. Ocho Cinco, Chad Johnson, will also be declaring he actually never caught a pass, but he probably would have been wide receiver four or five this year, so he would have been able to make an impact. Foyet Akibola kind of caught me off guard. He was the main complimentary back along with Taz Will Hubbard had a pretty good season 10 touchdowns 770 yards over a thousand yards from scrimmage that's a big loss he's a good player and then Marcus Grum a two-year starter he had 67 pancakes in the past two years Derek Davis also wants to transfer. That's a pretty big loss, but we do have a lot of young talent at outside linebackers, so that's not the, the end of the world. We have a lot of key seniors leaving. One of the biggest hits is running back Taswell Hubbard, who had over 3,300 rushing yards, over 1,000 receiving yards, and 44 rushing touchdowns in his Westlake career. Definitely deserves to be a first-round pick, one of the most talented and one of the most accomplished offensive players in school history. Damian Rose will be leaving as well, only was a one-year starter, but he is a very talented player, had seven receiving touchdowns this past season on around 500 yards. Damian Purcell had a very unique Wesley career. He played a lot of quarterback early on. He was a high school quarterback, threw the ball a little bit too often in this series, wasn't always the most consistent there, but this past year as a receiver, he was really impressive with nine receiving touchdowns. He made the All-Pac-12 first team this past season. Although he only caught four passes in his first three seasons, he was really good as a senior. 
Jabari Achebe had a very weird career. His sack numbers declined every season of his career, but he's super talented and well-deserving of a first-round pick. I think if we had gotten to use him the final two seasons of the series, he could have been one of the most accomplished pass rushers in school history. Jacob Williams, first round. What a story. This kid was a walk-on a few years back, and when I saw this kid, I was pretty impressed. How is this guy a walk-on? He only really started this past season, but he was maybe the best defensive lineman in college football. 22 tackles for loss, five and a half sacks. Without a doubt, the best walk-on in school history. He absolutely deserves to be a first-round pick. Gordon Waters Key, a four-year starter, did a little bit of everything. He was productive in the run game, could get to the quarterback, only one interception. But he's going to be a second-round pick. I think he was a really talented collegiate player, and I think he's going to be a good pro. We have three players going undrafted, including linebacker Edwin Jadiri, who was fine the past two seasons of his career, kind of used as our fourth linebacker. And then the other two players going undrafted, they have no business not getting picked. Anthony Cortez III at quarterback. I think he's the greatest Westlake quarterback of all time, and I know that's a crazy statement. I know there's Champ Britton, Peyton Curtis, Stephen Westwood, arguably Keith Fleming in that conversation. This past season was one of the greatest by a Westlake quarterback of all time. And Anthony Cortez started in three national championship victories. No other Westlake quarterback can say they've started in more than one national championship win. So I really think he is the greatest quarterback in Westlake history. I'm not surprised he's getting undrafted because he is smaller, but he absolutely deserves to be a first round pick. Lubert's Roy getting undrafted really surprises me. He's not that small. 6'3", 220. That's big for a middle linebacker. Obviously, he has the talent and the ratings to back him up. One of my favorite players to use in this series. His numbers weren't super impressive the final two seasons, but he is such a good player. One of my personal favorite Westlake defensive players of all time. He's going to be a first-round pick. I don't know why it says undrafted, but once these guys are imported into the Madden class, like AC3 and Lou Bertsroy, they're probably going to be first or second round picks. Jill Kilpatrick, the former Westlake Hornet, ends up going in the first round, had a very solid career at NC State this past season, had a career-high 29 touchdowns and was pretty efficient. And then another former Westlake quarterback, CeCe Vaughn, ends up going undrafted again. This doesn't really surprise me because he's not the biggest, six foot 190, but he should get picked. At the end of the day, we had to decide between CC Vaughn and AC3. We ended up choosing Cortez, and I think that was the right choice. CC Vaughn played with us his freshman season, then transferred to UCLA, was a starter three years there. And although he definitely was not bad at UCLA, I think we made the right choice. I think Anthony Cortez did have the slightly better collegiate career. Actually, I wouldn't say slightly. He was noticeably better than CC Vaughn, but CC deserves to get drafted. I think he's going to be a pretty good NFL quarterback. These players will be imported into the second draft class into the Madden 22 franchise, which will be starting pretty soon. I'm very excited about that. Next year's class of players will also be in the Season 2 draft. I'm pretty much combining two draft classes of players and putting them into one for each Madden 22 draft class. I hope that makes sense. As we get closer, uh, you'll understand what I'm saying. So, recruiting's going to be kind of weird this year. If you guys remember, at the end of last episode, we were locked out by a few good players like Deshaun McDonald and Jonathan Singleton. We were doing really well in these battles, but I noticed we had 25 players in this recruiting class, and I'm pretty sure 25 is like the limit. I've never seen a team get more than 25 players in a single recruiting class, so I think the reason why they were locked out is we had too many players we were going after. Technically, we still have 15,000 points, so I'm going to put them all into Christian Berg. If we don't get him, it's fine, but I figured, hey, it's worth a shot. Maybe 25 isn't the limit, and maybe those players just locked us out for no reason. Well, sure enough, we did not get Christian Berg. He ended up going to USC. So we did not add anybody in the offseason, which is fine. I wasn't really expecting to. Deshaun McDonald went to New Mexico State when he could have probably started early on here. Uh, we barely lost out on Clifton James, so maybe we should have put those points into him. But it doesn't really matter. We have an absolutely loaded recruiting class, certainly one of the most talented in recent memory. We finished with 19 four-stars. Yes, 19. 
That's a lot. We also had three five stars and three three stars. Nobody had more than 25, as you can see. So I am pretty sure that probably is the limit. We also did not add any walk-ons as well. On to the position changes stage. There are a few moves we're going to make. Adam Thompson is going to slide back over to defensive end. Andy Greer is going to move from outside linebacker to middle linebacker. And then we have a lot of athletes. Brett Ward is going to play running back. Dante Hodges to quarterback. Reynolds and Bell will play wide receiver. McIntyre is going to play guard. Ernest Wright will move to running back. And Michael Walker is going to play defensive end. Although he also probably could have played running back as well. On to training results, one of the more fun parts of the offseason. We do not have any new 99 overall players. Our only 99 is Isaiah Thomas, who already was a 99. Greg Waters' key of the starting quarterback is a 93. So it's good to see him progressing at a pretty quick rate. He's arguably a better passer now than Anthony Cortez was last year. So we're in pretty good hands at the QB position. Thomas Hagen almost went to a 99. He is a 98. Khalil Onobanjo is a 97 and then as you can see the rest of these tate sullivan went up seven he's a 92 cutting players is certainly not a fun part of the offseason and since we have a very big recruiting class we have a lot of guys we have to cut eight and there were a lot of players i did not want to release i had to cut four-star athlete ernest wright i didn't want to do that but didn't really have much of a choice guard at tyler gordon we added him late as a walk-on i guess don't really want him. Leonard Hadley, we don't need, so we're going to cut him. Quarterback Early Hawkins has an absolutely sick name, but we are pretty much set at quarterback for the rest of this series. Michael Walker did not want to cut him. Same with Tony Rogers. These are good players we are releasing. Jimmy Fletcher as well, but I just didn't really have much of a choice. The final player we're going to cut, another good player, is cornerback Carl Jenkins. Those are all guys I would have loved to have kept, but we didn't really have much of a choice. So now we are into the preseason. We're going to be redshirting all of our true freshmen. None of those guys are going to be starters. So I figured we might as well save an extra year of eligibility. Here is the depth chart. Greg Waters Key will be the starting quarterback. The main running backs will be Adam Rutledge and Malik Bostic the second. Our offensive line is very young. The defensive line, too. Three of our four starters are freshmen. And Brandon Burks, Deshaun Yates and James Jackson. The secondary has a lot of veterans, though, so hopefully our secondary can use their experience and talent to their advantage. And then looking at the custom schedule, our non-conference opponents are Utah State, Illinois, Penn State, and San Jose State. So two tough Big Ten teams in Illinois and Penn State. On to recruiting. I forgot to add players in the preseason, so I did not scout any of them. So... Yeah, I guess that kind of adds a challenge, which we kind of need because recruiting the past couple of years has been too easy. We are going to be offering players who are first scholarships, hoping that they insta-commit. Last year, we got really lucky, but this year, we have not. There we go. Offensive tackle, Billy Bird, who is a 73 overall. That's a pretty good get. I do want some more depth on the offensive line, even though it is already very young. But yeah, we are not getting lucky at all with the insta-commits this year. And last year, we got so many. Luckily, we would add one more in Ryan Lilly, an athlete who is a gem. He's about 6'2", 260, probably going to be an offensive lineman, but he could also play receiver. He has good receiving stats. It would be kind of fun to see a 6'2", 260-pound wide receiver. This is how we're going to be allocating our points to start the season. I will show you guys a recruiting update as we reach the midseason point. And that's where we are going to sim up to. Unless there's any funny business, I will meet you guys after the Penn State game. And we started off well. We won our first five games, but unfortunately, we actually lost to Penn State at Happy Valley, 27-17. So we are now 5-1, number 8 in the country. Our national championship hopes are definitely not dead but it's going to be a challenge. Our first five wins were all pretty much blowouts with the exception of the Stanford game. We have three more ranked opponents, so it's going to be pretty tough. But if we can win out and play a team like Cal or USC in the conference championship and beat them, we could certainly get into the national championship game if things go our way. This has been a weird season for us offensively. Greg Waters' key has been pretty good, although he has not completed 50% of his passes. The run game has been kind of disappointing, though. It's been super inconsistent. Adam Rutledge and Malik Bostic II have both played pretty well. It's not their fault, 
but we just have not consistently ran the ball. This team is led by the defense, specifically as I expected the secondary. Khalil Onabanjo has been the best cornerback in college football this year. He already has four interceptions. And recruiting this year has been really good. We've added a lot of depth to the secondary, the offensive line, and the defensive line, which is three spots that I really wanted to focus on. We're going to simulate our next three games. Pretty tough stretch against Utah, Oregon, and Washington. And we would win all three of them. And we have jumped up to number four. The only teams ahead of us are Army, Texas, and Virginia Tech. So there's definitely a world where we jump into the top two. But we're going to have to win our final three regular season games. We're going to have to win the conference championship as well. Our final three games aren't too bad. BYU is kind of tough. I did not talk about Isaiah Thomas earlier, but he is currently first in the Boletnikov watch. He has been an absolute machine this year. He's the best receiver, maybe the best player in the entire country, if we're being honest. Going to simulate the rest of the regular season. We ended up scoring 72 against San Jose State. I knew we were going to blow him out, but I wasn't really expecting that. So we did win our final three games. We're now 11-1. We barely beat BYU in overtime, but hey, a win's a win. So, the top 25 is very interesting, as you can see. Army and Texas are the top two. They are undefeated. We are three. Our opponent, Cal, is four. So, we need to beat Cal, and we need Army to lose to Virginia Tech or Texas to lose to Oklahoma. Herb Street is rocking with us. We're going to simcast this game, and we need to win in order to survive. It's going to be a pretty tough task, but... I think our defense has been the best in the nation. Cal's rushing attack is really good. They lead all of college football in rushing yards per game. So it's going to be tough. Two really, really good teams. And there's a really strong chance the winner of this game makes the national title. I don't think either of us would jump Army or Texas if they both won, although it is possible. So we're going to need one of those two teams to lose in order for us to possibly make the national championship but we can't really focus on them because those games are not in our control we need to take care of business today we need to beat cal and we need to put fate in our own hands if we want to make this year's national title game cal is going to choose tails tails never fails they win the toss they will start on defense so we are going to sim cast by quarter I certainly would love to set the tone here on offense on this first drive, but both offenses started this game off kind of slowly. Not a lot of early action. Eventually, Cal would march down the field and score a touchdown. We would answer right back, however, a touchdown for Tyler Anderson to tie it at 7, and that would conclude the first quarter. Cal is marching on the doorstep, and they would answer with a touchdown of their own, so the Golden Bears are back up 14 to seven. Our offense has not been overly impressive in this game as Cal would add a field goal. They now lead by 10 and then Ben Jones would tack on a field goal to end the first half. So we're only down by seven, certainly uh, far from out of this game. And then we would end up tying it, but Cal quickly scores a touchdown back. It's now 24-17 to conclude the third quarter, but we do have the ball. We are moving it down the field pretty nicely and we would score a touchdown to tie it up at 24. Cal gets it back, and it would be an interception for Andy Keith inside the 50-yard line. A huge turnover, but sure enough, we would not score. By the way, look at the bottom. Oklahoma has defeated Texas, so the winner of this game will make the national title. Cal drives down the field and scores. It's now 31-24. I decided to hop in. A couple years ago, we were in a similar situation against USC in the Pac-12 championship. I did not hop in. We lost, and I regretted it. I did not want to make the same mistake here. There's a nice grab by Dominic Porter. Westlake already passed the 50. Tough throw for Tommy Taco, the converted running back to tight end, who gets a gain of 13. Taco's been a little bit banged up this year with injuries, but he's healthy today, and he makes a big catch. Waters key now up the middle for maybe not just the best receiver, but maybe the best player in college football this season, Isaiah Thomas the third for the first down. Westlake is really moving the ball well here, but I think they don't want to give Cal too much time on the clock, but the top priority has to be scoring a touchdown, and that is exactly what's going to happen. Tyler Anderson for six, and the Westlake Hornets will tie it up. Cal still has plenty of time. They have about a minute-ish, a little bit over, to drive down the field and possibly win this game and put themselves in the national title. There is a wide-open throw for Cam Rogers. That was bad coverage by Khalil and Obanjo. 
and I don't want to harp on him too much because Ona Banjo has been phenomenal this season, but that was a bad play. There is a wide open Stephen Cantrell on the out route for a gain of eight. So far, Cal's offense is having no issues moving it down the field. Westlake's defense has been so good this year, but today they really have, for the most part, not shown up. Ty Murphy on first down, about 50 seconds to go, gets it over to Cam Rogers, who gains 16 yards, and Cal is definitely in field goal range now. So if you're Westlake, you just want them to score quickly or force a turnover, obviously. Loss of yards there, nice play by the linebacker, Alex Rodriguez. No steroids needed for that play. That's going to be a loss of a yard. Westlake decided to call a timeout. They know they need as much time as they can get. Ty Murphy has blocks. Murphy into the end zone for a touchdown. And the Cal Golden Bears will take the lead. Now Westlake still has a decent amount of time. And they have two timeouts. So this game is not over. But I'd be lying if I said the Hornets were not in trouble. A major opportunity and a, maybe the most important drive in the young career of redshirt sophomore Greg Waters Key. Let's see what he can do. About 40 seconds to go on first down. Waters key on the run with a strike. What a throw for Dominic Porter who gets the first down. One of the biggest throws in the career of Greg Waters key on the run. Threading the needle. That was a risky throw. If he underthrows that interception, ball game over. So Westlake's going to keep the drive moving. Now around 20 seconds to go. Waters Key gonna scramble with it. He puts Westlake now into the red zone. Field goal means nothing though. The Hornets are looking for a touchdown. Now down to 12 seconds. Hornets still have both timeouts at their disposal. So time really is not much of an issue. Short throw for Theodore Williamson. Williamson is in! Touchdown Westlake! And the Hornets will tie it at 38. Wow, what an ending to regulation here in this game. Cowell's just gonna run it with one final play and Harris will gain a round two so that will do it for regulation tied at 38 we are going to overtime the winner will advance to the national championship and the loser well I mean their season technically won't end but they'll just be playing for pride Westlake wins the toss they're going to start on defense so Cal will get the opening possession here in overtime and we'll see what their offense can do. Westlake's defense has been really good this season, but Cal has certainly uh, really played well on this side of the ball. Third and 11, big first down conversion of a tight end. Kenneth Barker, the linebacker, really could have jumped that route, but he was unable to. Second and goal, Ty Murphy keeps it himself. Another rushing touchdown for the quarterback, Murphy. So Cal marches down the field. They score the touchdown, and now Westlake is going to need to answer back. Third and three, it's a handoff for Adam Rutledge, the junior. Rutledge with a big conversion. He brings it to around the six-yard line. And the Hornets are getting close to this end zone. If they score a touchdown, we will head to a double overtime. Taylor Tyler, the senior in motion. Handoff for Rutledge. We are tied again. Double overtime now here in the Pac-12 Championship. Big touchdown for Adam Rutledge. So Wes Lake will start with the ball in this second overtime. So now that their offense is in a groove, maybe they can score some more points. The Hornets ran it on every play of the first overtime, but they're gonna start overtime number two of the pass. Risky throw for IT3, who makes the grab inside the 10 yard line. Big conversion for Thomas and the Hornets, and they now have it inside the 10, nearing the goal line. First and goal, Waters Key under a lot of pressure. Breaks the sack, nearly broke another one. He did his best to get out of that one, but he could not. Third and goal now at the two. Hornets in the goal line set. Waters Key tosses it to his former high school teammate, Quantrez Davis, for the touchdown. That is Quantrez Davis' first career rushing attempt. I don't know why he has not gotten the ball yet. He's a really good player, really tough, physical power back, but oh well, Westlake drives down the field and scores. It's now 52-45. And now Cal has their backs against the wall. They need to score a touchdown. Murphy on first down. Deep ball. Nearly intercepted. Right in the hands of Darsheen Brooks Jr. The junior corner. He really should have made a play on that ball. 
Second and ten now for the Golden Bears. Very next play. Murphy trying to avenge the near interception. And there's a big run from Swanson. He gets it inside the five to about maybe the one-yard line. And now first and goal. Can Cal punch it in and send us possibly to a triple overtime? Ty Murphy fakes the handoff. Keeps it himself. And that is Ty Murphy's third rushing touchdown since we hopped into the game. And that was like with two minutes left in the fourth quarter. So he's gotten three since then. Now it's tied at 52. We go to a third overtime. And if you score a touchdown from here on out, you're going to have to go for two. Murphy on the first play. He connects. Frank Washington tried to play the ball rather than play the receiver. And that decision backfired. Travis Parrish with the touchdown. And now Cal is going to go for the two-point conversion. Can they make it an eight-point lead? It's the fullback, Swanson, who got it. So best case scenario for Westlake is going into a fourth overtime. The Hornets cannot win it in overtime number three. A touchdown and a two-point conversion only ties it. First play on offense here in triple overtime. Greg Waters key connects with his favorite target, Isaiah Thomas the third, who brings it inside the 10-yard line. These offenses have just completely dominated here in overtime. Third and goal now. The Hornets have had a little bit of trouble on the goal line. Waters key under pressure, throws it away. So now this is it. Fourth and goal. The Hornets need to get a touchdown to keep their national championship hopes alive. If they don't score on this play, you can kiss the dream goodbye. Waters key, scrambling, looking to throw it. Looking for the end zone, touchdown, Dominic Porter. Porter has made a few really big plays in this game, and he's playing with broken ribs, might I add. So now Westlake has to go for two to try to tie it. If they do, we will head to a fourth overtime. Toss to the right side for Quantrez Davis, who gets in. I believe this is the second time in school history where we're headed to a quadruple overtime. The first, back in season 16, the final full season of the series, which was against LSU, we ended up winning that game. First play of overtime number four. It's Malik Bostic, the second. Touchdown, Hornets. Well, that's one way to start. That's Bostic's first carry in all of overtime. I don't know why he didn't get the ball more. But hey, when he gets his number called, he makes it count. Westlake has to go for two again. Can they make it an eight-point lead? It's going to be another toss for Quantrez Davis. And he is stopped this time. So if Cal gets a touchdown and a two-point conversion, they can win the game. Touchdown and no two-point conversion ties it. Anything less is a loss. First play for Cal. Murphy looking to throw it. He is intercepted by Adam Keith. The ball game is over, and Westlake has won the Pac-12 championship in four overtimes. A huge turnover by Adam Keith, who had two interceptions in this game. Major shout-out to the offense who in the four overtime periods scored four touchdowns. The defense was not great today. They allowed 60 points, but hey, a win is a win. This game was ranked as the number one ESPN Instant Classic throughout the entire series, by the way. Greg Waters, Key, and Adam Rutledge led the charge. Malik Bostic had a big play. Dominic Porter was phenomenal in this game. IT3 played really well. The defense, other than Adam Keefe, was pretty disappointing. But hey, at the end of the day, we won. That's really all that matters. So this means we will be going to the national championship unless the committee decides to, I don't know, be mean. Ruben Hines of USC wins the Heisman. He ran for 30 touchdowns. Isaiah Thomas well-deservedly wins the Boletnikoff Award. And we are indeed going to the national title game. We're going to be playing number one Army. A rematch of the national championship game back in season 10. Our first national championship win. They're led by quarterback Ruben Taylor and running back Andy Henderson. Kind of like with Oklahoma last year, this roster feels kind of underwhelming. I feel like Army has had way better teams that didn't get in. Army did win the national championship two years ago against Vanderbilt. We won it last year. So I guess the last five national championship winners are all playing in this game because we had our three-peat, then Army won, and then we won last year. So I guess that's kind of cool. These have been the two best programs in college football really for the last decade, if we're being totally honest. Second time they're facing off in the national title game. This is the first time 
Westlake is having a national championship rematch in Westlake's first, I guess, eight national championship games. They played against eight different teams. But now they're going to get an opportunity to face off against the Black Knights, who are number one in the nation, 13-0. Westlake had the best defense going into the conference championship week. Now they don't. Now they have, like, the second best defense. You know who's first? Army. So, just like the other bowl games, we're going to play the first drive on offense and the first drive on defense. I mainly do that to get a feel of the new team, but we literally just played, like, five or six drives with them, so I do already have a feel for them, but I did want to get to play another drive with these guys in the national title game. So Westlake will start on defense. We'll get to take a look at the Army offense. Hopefully Westlake's defense can play a little bit better than they did in the Pac-12 championship. First play from scrimmage, Ruben Taylor loses two. The redshirt freshman, Brandon Burke, brings him down. Nice play by Burke, a former high school athlete converted to defense event. Third and 12, now Taylor under pressure. Short throw is broken up by Ron Davis. So Westlake's defense forces a three and out, and they will now get it back on offense with an opportunity to drive down the field and get the first points of the game. The offense was phenomenal down the stretch in the Pac-12 championship. We'll see what they can do against Army. Greg Waters key on first down, connects with the best receiver in the nation, Isaiah Thomas III, who gets it inside the 35. That's one way to start the drive off, if you ask me. Very next play now for the Hornets. Waters key is joined by Malik Bostic the second in the backfield. Isaiah Thomas the third is the motion man, and it looks like it's going to be an option. Dear God. Waters Key tosses it for Thomas. Thomas. Whoa! Oh my goodness! What a run by Isaiah Thomas, the third, for a touchdown. That play was nasty. IT3 doing what he does best, finding the end zone. We got to look at that play again. I don't want to see Greg Waters Key again because he didn't do anything special there. We got to see the, that back juke. Jesus Christ, that is disrespectful. That's maybe one of the best plays in school history. Maybe that's a stretch, but that play was nasty. So we're going to sim out the rest of this game unless it gets super close at the end. Both offenses are having a little bit of trouble, but Army would get a last-second touchdown to end the first quarter, so it is tied at 7. Westlake marching down the field. Greg Waters key runs for a score, so we now take the lead 14-7. Now it's 21-7, and now look at this. We are dominating 28-7. What is happening? Army did score, but wow, what a second quarter. Fire Westlake Horn. It's on to the third quarter. We'll see if we can keep the momentum rolling as we do at a field goal. Army moving down the field. They don't score. And we are still up by three possessions. A very comfortable lead. And we have the ball inside the red zone to start the fourth quarter. We would add another field goal. It's now 34 to 14. And it really does not look like Army can get back into this game. This is just an all-out blowout for the most part. Now 41-21. I wanted to play the final minutes of this game. Final moments here of Westlake's, what, seventh national championship victory, I believe. Taylor up the middle, connects with B.J. Palmer. That play would give him the most receiving yards in a single season by any Army player ever. Army is steadily approaching the goal line. Now third and two. It's a toss for Andy Henderson, who does get the touchdown. So Army makes it a two-score game. But the Black Knights are not in a good spot. They need an onside kick, a touchdown, an onside kick, and another touchdown within the span of 36 seconds. The onside kick would be picked up by Dominic Porter. And this one is over. The Westlake Hornets will go back-to-back. -back, and they're going to win their seventh national championship in school history. Greg Waters Key adds his name to the list of quarterbacks who have won national championships with this team as he does take the final kneel down. And the Hornets are now 7-2 and all-time in the Natty. 41-28 is your final. Not necessarily a blowout, but this game never really was super close either. We were pretty much in control from start to finish. Uh, Greg Waters key had a pretty good game. He wasn't outstanding, but he wasn't terrible. For me, the player of the game is Isaiah Thomas. Had the 33-yard run, had 10 catches for 125 yards. He was unbelievable this season. I think there's a fair argument that he is a top three receiver in school history. I don't think he's better than Nigel Wiggins. But he's up there with Carter Westwood. I would probably put him past Carter Westwood. So I think he's the second best receiver 
in the history of this program, which is really saying something because we've had so many great, great wide receivers to come here. So we win back-to-back -back national championships over Army. This was a rocky season, but we were able to get it done. Greg Waters key, 37 passing touchdowns, 10 interceptions. He wasn't always the most consistent, but he's such a talented kid, and I think he's going to be great going forward. The run game still was not the most consistent, but Adam Rutledge and Malik Bostic the second were both pretty good. Isaiah Thomas, wow, what a career. 250 catches, 4,100 yards, over 40 touchdowns. He was unbelievable this season. The defense was really good for the most part. James Jackson, the freshman, was great. Khalil Onobanjo, one of the more dominant seasons a corner has had. Not quite as good as Joe Lilly's final season, in which he had 10 interceptions. But Onobanjo was great this season. He's going to be a stud in the NFL. Let's take a look at the All-Americans and award winners on the all NCAA first team of course IT3 he had to be there along with James Jackson Derek Berg Kenneth Barker and Khalil and banjo on the second team we had Brandon Daniels and Blake Wilson and that was it on the freshman team Tyler Weber Abdul Andrews who was not a starter uh, Lewis Palmer Jackson Burke Yates King and then on the All-Pac-12 team, Greg Waters Key is the first team quarterback. He's joined by Isaiah Thomas, Daniels, Wilson, Jackson, Burke, Hagen, Barker, Rodriguez, Ono Banjo. I think one of the safeties made, and then a few other guys. Here's the second team as well. So many All-Americans we had. We only had one award winner, which was IT3, but we did have a lot of guys in the running for different awards, including Greg Waters Key. Uh, we had Ono Banjo and Rodriguez very high for some of the defensive awards. James Jackson as well. Greg Waters Key was second on the Davy O'Brien. Second straight year, we finished second place for that award. Of course, of IT3, obviously we won the Boletnikoff, very well deserved. Uh, Brandon Daniels finished pretty high on some awards, even though he didn't have that great of a season. He allowed like nine sacks, which is kind of a lot for a center. A few defensive linemen and linebackers in the awards. Defensive backs as well, Khalil Ono Banjo finished second. Shamey was not able to win that. Tate Sullivan did not win another Ray guy. He finished sixth. And Taylor Tyler finished fourth for best returner. So that'll end today's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed another national championship victory for our Hornets. Three seasons down in the long-term sim. Two to go. Next episode will be season number 20. So if you guys are excited, make sure to like and subscribe. Peace out.